let's get started then. Um, I do think it's very noble of you all to come here on a Saturday afternoon. I, 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 I'm very touched and this is my last talk. I'm literally flying out of Hong Kong this evening to return to my home in New Zealand. And as this is the last talk, there are one or two things I'd like to say before I start. Um, I'm greatly honoured that, um, that Mrs. Sin Wai Kim, the, the wife of the very generous um, philanthropist who has supported my visit and, and supports many worthy causes in, in Hong Kong, and, uh, and friends and colleagues are also the recipients of his generosity. And so I'm very honoured that she should have come to this talk. And um, I know that um, Hong Kong is something that she finds very interesting, but um, I wish I had something more interesting to say myself, but I'll do my best. Um, and then finally, I, I want to say again a big thank you to the people here because, you know, I, I, this is my third visit to the Hang Seng College and I do always enjoy coming because the people are so friendly and um, they just make me feel at home here. And I've got to know them, you know, over the years. I, I first came in, I think it was two years ago in March, 2016, and I gave a series of five talks on that occasion about um, some of the older generation of translators, James Legge and people like that, and Herbert Giles, some of the people I'm, I'm very interested in. And this time I've just given, I've narrowed the focus down to translating that great novel, Hung Omong, which is one of my great, um, you know, passions, if you like. Um, the first lecture I talked about some of the early pioneers, nearly all of whom met an untimely death trying to translate this novel. It's quite a sad story, really, but um, some of you were here on that occasion. And there was a, a series of um, very brave people during the 19th century who all sort of had a go at um, translating this huge novel. And, um, and I, I'm, I'm so glad that, um, that one of my students, I won't mention her by name because you'll be embarrassed, but, um, I worked on this topic with a student at PolyU many years ago, in fact two students, both of whom have come today. It's a great pleasure to see them. And they worked on this topic, I mean, some of these early people, and did some very serious and useful work, which I completely relied upon for my first lecture. So I'm so glad they didn't come for my first lecture, because they would have realized I was using their work. But I did give credit for it. Um, so I talked about that in the first lecture. In the second and third lectures, I was, I was sort of, um, using primary materials, letters and notebooks and things like that, to try to um, take a stand against the pernicious influence of translation theory, which is like chemical warfare in a sense. It's what people do when they can't translate and then they try and, um, you know, they, they try and lay these um, toxic ideas, which they call translation theory. And I, I, I'm of the opinion that it's a big waste of time, but that you can learn something by looking at the primary materials, the letters and lives and notebooks and so on, of great translators. We can learn from that. And um, because I, because the Chinese University has a wonderful collection of David Hawkes' papers, I was able to use his letters, primarily his letters to me and my letters to him, because it's a kind of interesting dual, two-sided correspondence. So I talked a lot about that in my second and third lectures. And this is my final lecture, and what I'm trying to do today, and I don't know if I'll succeed, but I'm going to try, is to sort of to point the way towards what I think are the principal reasons why this great translator was able to do such a magnificent job. Because it's not enough just to say, oh, it's great. You know, you've got to say, how did it become great? How did he manage to do that? And I think I've thought about this a great deal over the last 20 or 30 years. And I've started to look into it in some detail, and I think I've found one or two clues which I want to share with you today, because I think they're, I think they're quite an extraordinary um, uh, uh, indicator of what was going on in this man's life that enabled him to, to go beyond the normal sort of um, rules, the normal level of translation. So that's what I'm going to try and do today, and um, I hope you'll bear with me, because it's quite long and quite complicated. Um, let's see if I can get this one. I've called it In the Garden of Perfect Freedom, which um, it'll become clear why I've called that at the very end, if you can be patient. And then I've, sub I've subtitled it Between Two Worlds, the Sinologues, that's the French word for sinologists, 
and the Dharma bums, and I'll explain who the Dharma bums are a bit later. And you see, the, the, the main, if you like, point of my talk today is that David Hawkes lived between these two worlds. He was, he was not really torn between them, but, but, he, but he managed to step very, in a very agile manner from one world to the other, backwards and forwards, throughout his life. Um, and um, I think it's very unusual. I mean, there have been one or two others, but he was very unusual in the way in which he, he, he strode the stage. I mean, he, he, he was, belonged to both of these worlds and established an incredible degree of freedom in both. Um, and here he is. This is a, I, I picked this photograph because he's in a very lovely garden. Um, this, in fact, was a photograph that I took of him in the summer of 2009, about a month before he died, actually. And we visited a, a very wonderful garden called Sissinghurst in Sussex, which was built by a, a, a woman called Vita Sackville West, who was a, a friend, in fact, a lover of um, Virginia Woolf. And she and her husband, Harold Nicholson, um, built the most beautiful garden there. And David um, was particularly happy on, on his visit to that garden. And it's one of my favorite photographs because he's looking up into amazement, you know. He looks very happy. And he didn't always look happy, you know. In fact, later on, I got a picture of him looking thoroughly miserable. But he was happy on this occasion. So I feel he's in the garden of perfect freedom. Now, um, I want to begin with some of his own words taken from his introduction to the first volume of the, of the Hunger Mung translation. And um, I'm going to try to speak more slowly today because I met a young student the other day who said that she'd been to two of my lectures and basically didn't understand a word I was saying. But she thought it was slightly nice, but she just couldn't understand it. So I will try to speak a little bit more slowly um, so that I can be sure that you're actually understanding what I'm saying. These are his words. I'm going to read it because it's, it's important. Many of the symbols, the word plays, and secret patterns with which the novel abounds on them seem to be used out of sheer ebullience, as though the author was playing some sort of game with himself and didn't much care whether he was observed or not. Chinese devotees of the novel often continue to read and reread it throughout their lives and to discover more of these little private jokes each time they read it. That's so true. Many such subtleties will, I fear, have vanished in translation, alas, as odd tablet uh, Ji Husa would have said. He was one of, the com one of the family members who commented on the novel. Another one was called Ji and Jai. And um, so he's always saying, alas, you know, in his comments. He's rather sentimental. But David's saying, you know, the novel's full of these secret things, these secret messages and secret plays on words. And it is true. Every time I go back to it and read it, I discover more. And what, what I find so interesting now is that thanks to this invitation to come here, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. And of course, I think there are lots of secret games going on in David's translation as well. In that respect, he was a worthy successor to Tsar Skotin. And that's really what I'm talking about today, is that David himself was playing a game with himself. And he didn't really care whether any, anybody noticed, because he was just doing it for the hell of it, for his own pleasure. He once said to me, John, you know why we're doing this, don't you? And I said, well, I don't know. I, I'm just, he said, we're doing it for the hell of it. And that, it doesn't mean that it's hell. I mean, you have to understand this expression, doing something for the hell of it. It doesn't mean it's hell. It means you just have to do it, you know. You just do it because you have to, because there's no choice. You're doing it for the hell of it, for the sheer pleasure of it. And um, I'm going to begin by plunging in the deep end, if you like, to the opening of the novel, when you know the story when how this, this um, magical stone is rejected by the goddess Nuwa. It isn't, it isn't um, deemed fit to do a job of repairing the sky, and, and it ends up lying at the foot of a mountain, which is called in the novel um, uh, Qingdong Feng, right? And, and I've just given you a, a picture of, of the stone, because you have to have a picture of the stone, otherwise it doesn't make sense. And this is from the wonderful illustrator of the early 19th century named Gai Qi. Um, and of course, the, the, now if I can get this little red thing, this is the Chinese text, you see, says that the, um, the stone was left at the bottom of a, of a, of a feng, a, a mountain peak called Qinggeng, right? And thanks to the, uh, the manuscript 
um, editions of the novel. I must be careful not to fall off there. Oh, I'll be like someone at the bottom of Ching in front of myself. <laughs> You know, I'll be a stone that was not worthy to repair anything. Um, and you see here, this is an extract from the Jia Xu Ben um, of the novel. Very, that was the one that Hu Shi managed to get hold of in the 1920s. And it's, it's, it's probably the most interesting of all the manuscripts. And you see, um, and here, here's, the chai, here's the main text. You see, Bian, Qi Zai, Ci Shan, Qing Gong Feng Xia. And that's the real, that's the kind of one level of meaning, you see. But then this very nice red inscription by, by the, the commentator, Zhe Jai, you see, he, he says, um, he says here that, 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 that these two words, um, Qing and Gun, are actually a, a, a pun, they're a riddle for the two words, Qing, Gun, right? Qing meaning, you know, feeling. Although Qing is very hard to, to translate. It means feeling, passion, a whole load of things. And, and Gun, of course, means, um, here we are, Gun there, you see, Qing Gen. So this, this Qing Gen, and I believe that in Nanjing the two words are pronounced the same. Is anybody here from Nanjing? But I think it's, it's been said many times that that um, that Ta Xue Qin, because he grew up in Nanjing, couldn't tell the difference between Gen and Gen. So, so this, this actually means that, that, that the Gen here is really Gen. And, and of course, Gen is a, is a Buddhist term, you know, as, as we stumble through life in search of enlightenment. We have all kinds of gun, you know. There, there, there are the roots of the problem. They're the things that prevent us from reaching enlightenment. And they might be greed or lust or whatever, you know. And in the case of, of, of our hero, Jabayu, of course, we know it was Qing, you know, it was he had, you know, this illness called Ai Hong Bing, right? He loved he loved all the things that went with the colour red, you know, including ladies. He loved to be in the company of ladies because he thought boys were just rubbish. You know. There have been people throughout the, throughout the ages in all kinds of different cultures who've had the same views. And I look around me today and 90% of my audience uh, are members of the fairer sex, which says something about somebody or something. But um, um, so, you see, sorry, I've just been zooming ahead with this thing without meaning to. Um, so, um, so that's the Chinese. So in the Chinese, we've got these different levels of meaning. And it comes again and again. It's what keeps people coming back to the novel. Because this is just a very famous example. But there are lots of them. And David, it comes on the very first page, you see. And David was very, very, at that stage, still very full of energy. So he came up with the most wonderful solution for the translation of it. Um, because um, he called it, there we are. He called it green sickness peak. Now, most of us today don't know what the word green sickness means. We don't use it. We don't say to people, oh, you're suffering from green sickness, my dear, because no one would know what the hell you were talking about. But in the old days, it was a common word. And, and um, it's used, it's, it was used to mean love sickness. It means to be ill from love, right? And, and um, especially young teenage girls were subject to this condition. And they would they would look for green things, you know. They would try, and green things included things like chalk. And apparently, this, it, when when a young teenage girl was in love, she would crave to eat chalk. And it was seen as a symptom of this condition. And and David knew this, of course, because he knew everything. He was a man who read everything. And he also knew that the most famous example of this word comes in the great play um, Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare. And you see, one of the clues I've, I've really absolutely I'm sure about is that David was constantly referring to Shakespeare. The whole of his translation is full of echoes of Shakespeare. And I've only found a few of them, and I'm sure I could find dozens more if I had the time. And, and on this occasion, the echo was of Romeo and Juliet, because, you know, Romeo wants to, is in love with, I mean, Juliet's in love with Romeo, right? We all know that. And, and of course, we all know that Romeo and Juliet is the great tragedy of what we call star-crossed lovers, because they belong to two families who were at war with each other in, 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 in the Italy of, of times past. And um, in, in a very early scene, well, not in a very early scene, I mean, in, in Act 3, um, uh, um, Juliet's father talks to her very harshly, because you know he wants her to marry Paris. It would be very convenient. 
if she married this young man. But she's not in love with Paris. She's in love with Romeo, and he belongs to the wrong family. And, um, and he says to her, thank me no thankings, nor proud me no prouds, but fettle your fine joints against Thursday next to go with Paris to St. Peter's Church, or I'll drag thee on a hurdle thither. Out, you green sickness carrion. That means you, you lovesick piece of meat. Right? Not a very nice thing for a father to say to his daughter. Out, you baggage, you tallow face. So this is a very famous scene, and there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that when, when David translated um, um, Ching Gung Fun as green sickness peak, um, he had this in, his, in, in the back of his mind, in fact, in the forefront of his mind. And I, I even wrote a piece about this many years ago, 30 years ago, I wrote an essay about it. And I didn't dare show it to him because I, I thought, maybe I'm wrong. But in, the, in my essay, I said, this is what he was doing. And then somebody else showed it to him without my knowledge, in fact. And he said to me on one occasion, oh, by the way, John, I've read your article. And I thought, oh, God, I was so worried that I completely got it wrong. And he was a man of few words. He just said, you're completely right. I was so relieved. So in other words, he confirmed that what he was doing here was playing with the words green, you see, ching, and sickness, and referring to Romeo and Juliet for the echo of Shakespeare. But also, most importantly, he was giving readers a clue on the very first page that this is not going to have a happy ending. you know, Because as you know, both Romeo and Juliet end up dead. That's where their love goes. And, 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 and in this novel, of course, um, Jiao Baiyu doesn't end up dead, but Lin Dayu certainly does. So theirs is also a star-crossed love, what, what Shakespeare calls in Romeo and Juliet a star-crossed love. And although they weren't like two families at war, but it was certainly the Jiao family that caused um, Lin Dayu's premature death by, by treating her in a very like, cynical and, and, hard, and hard-hearted way. So I'm really, I'm throwing this one out at the beginning because it seems to me to be the most obvious and the most powerful example of what David was up to. You know, he was playing a very, very clever game, a very subtle game, and, and the echoes of Shakespeare go right through the book. And now that I've started to see, because you know, once you see the thing, you start to see more and more examples of it. And I've seen more and more just in the last week. And the interesting thing is that quite a lot of them are actually from Romeo and Juliet. So I think he had Romeo and Juliet going in the back of his mind all the time, you know, because that's also, it's about the love between two teenagers, you know. Chao Ba Yu and Lin Dai, they were teenagers, they weren't grown-ups, they were kids. And, um, and, and you know, their, 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 their extraordinary relationship came to a very sad end, as we all know. And uh, he was doing something very clever, very naughty, you see. He was translating South in, but using Shakespeare as a background noise throughout the play. And I found three or four more examples from Romeo and Juliet, and lots of other references to Shakespeare as well. So this is a man doing something very, very naughty that doesn't really con you know, conform with any theory of translation, thank goodness. Um, he was just amusing himself. He didn't care if nobody noticed. He was doing it for his own pleasure, for the hell of it. And that's the secret to his great art. You know. He was a very, very mischievous translator. A very mischievous translator. And I, I think Tai Tu was a very mischievous author, you know. And indeed, so was Paul Swan Ming. I mean, all the greatest authors are mischievous, you know. They're up to no good, you know. Um, so, um, now, I then started to think to myself, how did David get like that? You know, because we don't, we don't just, we're not just born, you know. Um, mischievous and brilliant and creative and so on. And he went through certain important experiences in his life. And I started to sort of gradually piece together what I think is some of it, it is a part of the story of how he ended up becoming such a wonderful translator. And I think the first thing I want to talk about is his friendship with the poet William Empson and with, with, with William Empson's wife. Because when David went to Peking in 1948, he was he was welcomed by the Empsons. He lived with them for a while, and they looked after him. And when he finally got married in 1950, it was, it was Mrs. Empson who organized the wedding and everything. So he, he was almost part of their family. And he continued to talk of them with great affection right up and throughout his life. And you know, I've always known this, but I've never ever before connected it to his, um, 
his way of translating, but I think, I think now as I think about it, um, along with Shakespeare, I have to say William Epson was one of the influences in, in Hawkes' um, development as a translator. Now, of course, um, and it's, no, it's no accident that the very last thing that David published was a long essay in the Times Literary Supplement about one of William Epson's poems. And he published it, um, he published it in um, February um, 2009, and uh, a mere four months later, he died. And it was literally the last thing he wrote. And I, I, was, I was trying to help him find a publisher for several months, but he, he eventually got it into the Times Literary Supplement. The whole thing, it's very long. And, and extremely well written, and it's all about one of William Epson's Chinese ballads. Um, so I, I think there's a clue there. There's something going on. And if you read William Epson's biography by John Hathenden, there are many references to David in that. And um, so, so I'm going to just develop this idea of Epson a little bit further, because Epson was a very interesting man. Um, you know, he ended up in China because he was at Magdalen College, Cambridge, in the days when it was illegal to have sex, and um, his, 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 his scout, the guy who cleaned his room, discovered a packet of contraceptives in his bedside table, and he was immediately thrown out of Cambridge. I mean, that, that was in the 1930s. As a result of that, he ended up going to China. So the strangest thing is take people to China, you know, and he ended up teaching at Beida and also later on teaching at Xinan Lianda in Kunming. So he, a, very, a very substantial chunk of Empson's life was spent in China. He never knew a word of Chinese. Apparently, the only expression he ever learned was Liang Tai Shui because he liked having cold water, right? So that was, those are the only three Chinese words he ever learned. So he never learned Chinese, but he had a huge influence on Chinese students at Beida because he was a brilliant lecturer. When they, when they started to move down south, uh, a lot of them were walking, you know. They ended up in, um, on a hill in, in, in Hunan and they had no books or anything. All he had, all Epson had was a typewriter and some paper. And he typed out a lot of Shakespeare by heart because he knew it by heart. So here we are, Shakespeare again. You know, I mean, you can't get away from Shakespeare. And, um, and Epson was this very, very interesting, charismatic, brilliant lecturer. Uh, I find his poetry rather unreadable myself. It's rather too intellectual for me. But he, he wasn't, he was very, broad-minded. I mean, he was one of the people who really admired Dylan Thomas, and Dylan Thomas was quite the opposite kind of poet from Emerson. So Emerson, although on the surface he's terribly clever, he went to my school, actually, he went to Winchester, and he was always a very clever boy, and, um, and brilliant. But, but he was also a very free spirit. I think that's the key word. He was, he was a, very, a very free individual and lived a very free life. And this was when David arrived in Peking, he suddenly found himself thrown into the Epson family and discovered that there were other ways of living, that other ways of living that were very different from what he'd grown up with, because the Epsons were absolutely crazy, you know. They, they, they really did, they broke every rule of sort of, you know, how you're supposed to live, thank goodness. Um, and of course, Epson's first book, and his most famous book still, was a book called Seven Types of Ambiguity. Now this is starting to sound interesting because of course what David was playing with was ambiguity. He was playing with levels of meaning. He was playing with the kind of things that Thomas Tim was playing with, words that are more than words. They're puzzles. They're clues to something deeper than words. And, and Emerson's, Emerson's essays of, of, of literary criticism are quite extraordinary because they're based on very, very close reading of texts. I mean, although he's famous as a critic, Perhaps I've heard it read. I've, I've read it said that he was the lead, the, the most distinguished literary critic of the 20th century. I don't suppose the Americans would agree with that. But I mean, he was he was a man who had no axe to grind, no theory to push, but he read texts with incredible um, intensity, and that was one of his qualities. And this was his most famous book. Um, and I, I, I've summarised some of the ideas in it because it says this book mines the astonishing riches of linguistic ambiguity in English poetic literature, unearthing layer upon layer of irony, suggestion, and argumentation. And this is actually a quotation from Seven Types of Ambiguity. Many poems depend on multiple, even opposed meanings for the same word or phrase. 
Battle, for example, in Gerard Manley Hopkins' poem, The Wind Hollow. It's a wonderful poem. For example, meant both fasten, battle your belt, and crumble the bicycle wheel battle on impact. Just as Hopkins, in Emerson's view, felt both completed and crushed by his Jesuit training. This is the kind of way of thinking that I recognize so much in, in David's way of talking about literature. So I think the influence of, of, of Emerson was just colossal. And uh, this is an early photograph of Emerson um, at Beida, before, um, where's Emerson? There he is, there. Before, um, I think that's him, I'm not sure. But that was before David arrived. And when David finally, uh, this is Emerson at Cambridge with I.A. Richards, who was his great friend and mentor, another very famous critic, who wrote some very important works on literary criticism. Um, and this is one of Richard's quotes. Poetry is a perfectly reasonable means of overcoming chaos. You know, these are not conventional critics. They're people with really startling ideas. And, and, um, and when David first arrived in Peking, he was met at, in Tianjin off, off, straight off the boat. He was met by this lady. Um, that's Mrs. Emerson, Hetta Emerson. Later on, William Emerson was, was made a knight. He was Sir William Emerson. And she became Lady Hetta. She thought it was very funny because she wasn't a lady at all. She was quite the opposite, actually. But you see, um, they, this is the young David when he arrived in Peking in 1948. And they, she met him off the boat. She went all the way to Tianjin to meet him off the boat and, and brought him to Peking to their little... They had a kind of silver yuan in one of those old Peking houses in Hutong. And they, they, they put him up for several weeks in their house. And that, that's Emerson, with the, with the, he always had this wonderful beard. And uh, that's Hetta. And their, their lifestyle was, I think, what we would normally call bohemian. And I think they had what's normally referred to as an open marriage, which meant that Hetta basically, you know, she liked to have a whole series of different lovers. And he thought that was great fun. And he always used to write her notes saying, do find me another nice man, because he was actually uh, very bisexual. And they were very unusual, an un unusual couple. And um, there's David, you see, he went on a picnic with the Emsons. And, and he really was part of the family. And when Hetta died in about 2006 or seven, half another day, uh, David went to her memorial service and, and gave the most wonderful address, which I inherited as part of his papers. It's never been published. But I really wanted to, to go through it with you because it, it says so much about his, his, the way he was influenced by the Emsons in his life and in his way of thinking, and ultimately in his way of translating. Um, so this is some of what he said. Um, I can't remember much about that first encounter with Hetta, except that she was big and beautiful and had very blue eyes and very golden hair. I must have been introduced to Walter Brown, the young American friend who was Hetta's lover, who had recently moved in with them and was to stay there until they went back to England a few years later. William was temporarily absent. And um, he was in America. They were discussing a letter from him about relationships in James Joyce's Ulysses on the very day that I arrived. So he was suddenly plunged into this, into this very intense household that was living and breathing poetry and art and so on. And, um, and then this, what I remember most vividly about that first day in Peking is sitting with them later on in the evening under a tree in the courtyard with an early autumn moon shining overhead, listening in a sort of dazed enchantment to Verklärte Nacht being played on the gramophone. These were obviously very formative experiences to him. He'd come out of you know, England after the war. It was a pretty bleak, Oxford after the war was a pretty bleak place. And these are his reflections on Hetta. Which I find very moving. Hetta was a free spirit, the first really free spirit I'd ever met. And Peking half a century ago was, even by Chinese standards, conservative and old fashioned. When I think of her in that setting, I remember only the wonderful times we all had together and how somehow she was always at the center of whatever it was we were doing. Dear Hetta, there was so much life in her, so generously and openly shared with so many others. To me, her departure, that's her death, because this is written after her death, her departure feels like the end of an era. Now, you don't write like that about somebody unless they're really very important to you. And I think the Emersons were very, very important to, to David in his, in his whole life. And you see, this is their wedding photograph in Peking. And, and Hetta organized the wedding. And the party took place 
in the, um, the British legation. This is the, in one of the courtyards. And here's David, here's his wife, Jean, who'd come all the way out from England. And, um, and there's Emerson. And I don't know where Hetra is, she's somewhere there. I can't, I can't see where she is at the moment, but she was certainly there. And nearly all these people were interesting people. I could talk about them for half an hour, but I'm not going to. So, so right through the wedding and everything, the Emsons were like the, the Hawks' family in Peking. And this is another rather nice photograph of Emson. And this is Emson with his menage, because now, and that's Hetta, and that's, um, uh, that's Walter Brown, that's her boyfriend. That's David Kidd. He was a great Eastie who married a Chinese woman. It was what they call a, a marriage of convenience. And then this is a New Zealander called Max Bickerton. They were a kind of, you know, a group of pretty wild characters. Um, and this is earlier on when, when Emerson was working in the BBC. And there he is. And there's, um, there's George Orwell. And it's always said that George Orwell was in love with Hetta, and he, that William stole Hetta from George Orwell, who wanted to run off with Hetta himself. So he was very much, and these are all distinguished literary figures at the time in, in England. So, um, and this is, I just think this photograph's wonderful. This is quite late on, by which time he was Sir William, and she was Lady Hetta, but she was still a bad girl, you know. She never stopped being a bad girl, and he was always a bad boy. And, then, and then they were proud of it, you know. And David always spoke of them with enormous affection, but also enormous respect. And this is David Kidd, who was one of that group, as well, along with David, David, this David Hawks, David Kidd, who later moved to Japan and wrote a wonderful book called Peking Story about his life in Peking. And that's an aspect of yeah. And you see, I don't think anyone's ever put two and two together and, and realized that there's a link between David's life with the Ensigns and the way he translated. He was never going to be a straightforward translator. He was never going to be a sinologue, you know, like all the other boring sinologues whose names I won't mention. I mean, he was always going to be a creative spirit. And, and he was drawn towards other creative spirits. And the Ensigns, no one's ever discussed this aspect of, of David's life. The Ensigns were terribly important to him. And uh, he talked about them all the time, even after they died. And of course, the other person who I have talked about last time I was here uh, is Arthur Whaley. And David was very close to Arthur Whaley. And I, I can only find one or two photographs, but this is, this is David um, visiting Whaley in his garden in London when, Dave, when Whaley was already quite an old man. Um, and it's one of the photographs of the two of them together. In fact, the other one's almost identical. And um, there are. There are so many aspects of, 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 of his way of thinking that I think are, are relevant. Another one is that he was a huge admirer of William Morris. For various reasons, he was, he was a, a convinced, I mean, David was a convinced socialist, and of course Morris was a socialist too. But, but he regarded William Morris as a, as a sort of a role model, because Morris you know, was also a translator of Icelandic. And um, we, we, we went more than once to visit the uh, William Morris house at Calmscott near Oxford. And um, this is him looking rather miserable, but he just visited the house. And I have to bring that in because I think, I think Morris is another person that we need to bear in mind. And Morris's household, of course, a bit like the Ensign's household, was an extremely, as we might say, open um, family because, I mean, um, you know, um, Rosetti, young Rosetti was after Morris's wife, as we all know, Jane. The neck that she was called because of her rather long, beautiful neck. Um, so this was this was the kind of a world to which David was already um, gravitating when he was in Peking in the 40s, and it continued to be a, a very important theme in his life. But then, of course, you know, like all of us, he had to earn a living, so he went back to Oxford and became a don, you know, and um, taught and had to go to meetings and you know all the usual things, you know. Um, uh, and um, he hated it. He just hated it so much that he just kind of, you know, gritted his teeth and kept doing it. And of course, he did it very well. He was a very, very fine um, scholar. I mean, terrifyingly good, actually. And um, and um, I, I, I happen to have in my possession his diary for the year, the years 1966 and 67. And it's very, very hard to read because he was writing for his own pleasure, not for publication. 
But um, I wanted to share one or two pages with you because I think they're quite revealing and they do lead us to the next chapter in this story. And this is the year 66. And um, this is the first page when he's setting off, you see, October 1966. Tidying, packing, shopping, leave by taxi after tea with Jean and the children to catch the 638 of Hamilton. And it's a very, very down-to-earth diary sometimes. So he's off to, off to London to get the train, and then eventually he gets, um, he, he flies to, um, his first destination is Cornell in America, in the University of Cornell. He stays there for several months, and there's a lot of interesting and not very polite stuff about the local scholars. And then he, he goes from Cornell to Harvard in um, January 1977. He stops briefly in Harvard, where his great friend is Robert Hightower, who had um, swapped houses with him. Um, that should be 1967. I'm so sorry, that's a mistake. 67, not 77. So he stops off in he stops off in Harvard and has some very interesting things to say about the Harvard sinologists. And then they all go to Bermuda. Um, it's a big conference. It's and I, I I use this Bermuda as a kind of a date which marks, in a sense, David's arrival as one of the great sinologists of the world. Because the people at that conference, they were all pretty, pretty big, big shots, you know. And um, and I, um, this and the diary he talks about all the things they did in Bermuda, and the people who were there. It's very interesting. Um, and then I think I should possibly skip ahead to talk about Bermuda because I've got these in slightly the wrong order. Hang on. Um, oh yeah, here we are. So this is the Bermuda conference, okay? So January 1967. These people are, are, are all together in the rather idyllic surroundings of Bermuda, all paid for by some big American foundation. And you look at the, you look at the list of people. But he's, this is the book that eventually came out seven years later, edited by Cyril Birch. And you know they've got uh, Chen Shixiang, they've got David, they've got Hans Frankel, James Hightower, James Liu, uh, Ye Jiaying, James Crump, Cyril Birch, Yaroslav Prushev came from, from Prague. And Patrick Hannon and CT I mean, it's like it's like you know the, the top cricket team, and there they all are in, in Bermuda. And it's fascinating reading the journal because they were all you know arguing and being behaving badly. But I mean, the point was this book represents one of the big moments in uh, the sinological world of the second half of the 20th century. And David was right there up with the others, you know, and he was a, he he established his, himself as one of one of the world's leading. Sinologists. I mean, and we have to recognize that. He was a heavyweight scholar. I mean, it was quite scary um, trying to be in his presence because he, he could master some very, very difficult textual details or um, he, he, could, he could really do the serious business of research. I mean, uh, he, could reduce, he could reduce a group of people to complete silence because they just couldn't possibly compete with his level of knowledge and understanding. So he was a very serious um, sinologist. I just, I like collecting photographs. I'll show you, this is a rather bad photograph of Cyril Birch quite late on. And then we've got um, Yaroslav Prushek comes in for some pretty rough treatment in the journal because he's, he's made out to be rather a bore and most of his time spent chasing ladies. And um, I remember David once saying that Yaroslav Prushek was a very big man in lots of ways. And um, he was very candid about his views on other sinologists. And this was Ye Jiaying when she was very young, of course. By this stage at Bermuda, she was a lot older than that. But uh, I couldn't find a photograph. So I had to find, I had to make do with this one. Of course, she's still alive. Um, there's Xiao Zheqing. He was at Bermuda as well. He always, he loved going to conferences and, you know, um, that was, and this is Robert Hightower. And um, now, so, so really by this time, um, by the time he went off on sabbatical, which was just before I met him, you see, I met him in 1967 when he came back. So I'm doing a bit of archaeology here. Um, <clears throat> he, he had already really made his mark in, 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 the, in the sinological world. And he went on throughout his life to cultivate some very special friendships with other sinologists. But they went, they all tended to be rather special people. For, I mean, for example, of course, you all know this guy because he died recently. And he was David's very close friend here in, in Hong Kong. And it was thanks to Rao Tsung Yi that, um, for example, um, the wonderful um, Wang Siu Kip, who ended up going to Oxford directly as a result of Rao Tsung Yi's 
personal letter to David saying, you know, I've got this wonderful student, you really should look after him. So Sue Kate went to Oxford and he became one of David's buddies, you know, they were real friends. And so and, and Ron Zungi, of course, he's not he's not just a scholar, and for goodness sake, he plays the chin, he does calligraphy, he does painting. You mentioned he does everything, he's a virtuoso and a terrific show. I mean, he, he's no longer with us, and I mourn his passing, of course, because he was a fantastic figure and, and a very, 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 very nice man. I mean, he was always very, very nice to me. And um, he very generously did the calligraphy for the front page of my E. Jing, which I was very touched by. And um, so I've always been fond of the guy. Um, and then the other person that David always talked about was the French scholar called Paul Demierville. And Paul Demierville was one of the great giants of French sinology. And he and David were, 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 were good friends. And David always, in fact, I think three or four times, told me the same story about Paul Demierville. How, when he was in Hanoi, as, as, a, as a scholar, as a research scholar of the French school of the extreme, l'extreme orient in Hanoi, against the building, it's a rather lovely colonial building. And Demierville was there after the war. And uh, he was describing to David how Demiel was describing how he first read Hung Lung Mung. He was lying in a hammock in, in the veranda of the, of, the, of the French school, and a monkey came in and sat on, on, on one of the beams in the roof and proceeded to pee all over him. So he remembers that was his first memory of reading Hung Lung Mung. And David liked that detail so much, he must have repeated the story at least four times. And um, he, he had a remarkable friendship with Demiel. And um, here, Demiaville, you see, with, with a younger Rao Tsung Yi. And they, they made a famous trip to Switzerland, which resulted in a whole series of poems being written in both French and Chinese. And um, this is his other great friend in France who died in the last two or three months, Jacques Gernet, a wonderful, um, a real austere scholar. I mean, David was never going to be like that, but he was a very good friend of Jacques. And this is André Lévy, um, who died uh, again in the last year, who, who was a great translator and, um, and someone after David's own heart. They were very good friends. And then, then we come to Jacques Pantano. Now, you see, of all these people, of all these French people, and David was very much a Francophile, he loved France, the one he was closest to was Jacques Pantano. And Jacques Pantano was actually he came to David's funeral and he gave a wonderful talk afterwards in which he simply said, I wish I could have been David, I wish I could have been like him. Because Jacques, all his life, he's a good friend of mine, he tried to be a creative sinologist. He tried to find ways of turning sinology, which can be really boring, into something that was fun. You know? And his way of doing that was to collect puppets. And, um, and this is him with his second um, wife um, when they came to visit me in France. And, um, these are some of the puppets that Jacques Pampano collected during his lifetime. And he created a museum in Paris called the Musée Croque Homme. And he used to perform. He could perform most of the ends out to using puppets, you know. And so he wasn't just a boring, you know, scholar. He was a creative artist as well. And the thing he loved more than anything else was performing with puppets. And he was a great, he liked to live as well. He had a really flamboyant lifestyle. and. Um, and he was, he was the person that David, David, when he first became professor at Oxford, I don't think this is public knowledge, but he wanted to employ two young lecturers um, in the department because he wanted to go in a different direction. So he wanted Jack, and he wanted another guy called John Scott. And the university ganged up against him and prevented him because they knew these people were very unconventional. They knew they were sort of, you know, the bad boys of sinology. So they, they said, we can't have someone like that. We've got to have some people who are much more straight up and down, you know. So then he, so he ended up appointing um, Glenn Delbridge and Ian McMorrin. I mean, Ian's a wonderful person, but he's not the same kind of type at all, you know. Um, he wouldn't mess about with puppets, for example. Um, and um, Glenn, of course, um, was, a, was a sort of, you know, good um, scholar. But, uh, so David always complained to me he'd, he'd been obliged to be conventional by Oxford. He hated Oxford ever after, because they wouldn't let him do his thing, you know. And finally, he resigned the chair in order to translate from their mum, because he had enough, you know, he had enough. Um, and this is John Scott. John Scott has been largely forgotten. The poor man drank himself to death, but he was a very, very gifted translator of Chinese poetry, and he was a great friend of David's. And David tried to sort of 
helped him throughout his life, which was unfortunately marred by a complete dependence on alcohol. But John Scott's translations of poetry were really wonderful. Um, and he was one of David's kind of buddies. Now, I'm just going to whiz back, because I think I left a whole lot of stuff out. Um, I'm very bad at organizing my PowerPoints. Um, oh, yes. I must, I must not leave this out. Go back to this page in the diary, 1967. Um, and um, uh, this is when David ended up in Japan. And um, he lived most of that time in, well, he was in Tokyo and then in Kyoto. And he was so miserable. You read the diary, just another day with a terrible headache, like, oh, God, I just want to go home, you know. He was really unhappy. Couldn't get through to Gene on the phone, you know. I'm just going to spend a day in bed. I hate this place. I hate the Japanese. I hate everything. He was really depressed. And then, and then things took a turn for the better because he met some like-minded folk. And amongst them were, it says here, um, they went to some local restaurant. Bert, now Bert, that's Burton Watson. Burton Watson was a great friend of his. But he was a, he was a more or less conventional scholar who translated Chinese poetry, mainly based on his Japanese, his knowledge of Japanese was outstanding. So Bert phones from the station, and we go to Snyder's place, because Gary Snyder was in Kyoto, and they were, and Gary Snyder and David became very good friends. Um, David once talked to me about zooming around Kyoto on the back of Gary Snyder's motorbike. <coughs> And I once said to Gary Snyder, did he remember putting David on the back of his motor? Oh, yes, he did. I remember. We had a wonderful time together. So they, they really were having a great time in, in Kyoto. Um, go back to Snyder's place um, by foot and bus. Philip Whalen then um, sorry, there was there. Right? Lots of drinking and later drugs. Mm. So they, had a lot of, they, they drank a lot, and then there were drugs on offer. I don't try the latter. Interesting. He didn't bother. He wasn't interested in drugs, but he said he, he was interested in drinking. I don't try the latter, which means I did try the former. So he obviously had a lot to drink. And Philip Whaler gets a bit, I can't read that, funny towards 1 or 2 a.m., but it passes over amicably and we have some good talk. All sleep on the floor. Well, I mean, they were having a good time, you know. He was mixing with Gary Snyder and Philip Whalen, and these two characters, and, and Bert Watson. Um, and they, they, both Gary Snyder and Philip Whalen feature very prominently in a book called The Dharma Bums by Jack Kerouac, which was the great, the great novel of the beat generation on the west coast of America. It's a really good novel, a really good read, actually. I enjoyed it very much. I mean, it's very light, but. Um, and, and, and it's, it's a kind of a legendary story, really, about these people. And there are other people like Alan Watts and so on. And it's a good read. But Gary Snyder features in the novel as Jackie Ryder. And Philip was Warren Crofton. And, um, and these are the people, this is the, this is the color, two colors of the novel. Um, Jack Kerouac, who became famous as the author of On the Road, and then he wrote The Dharma Bums. Um, and there's Philip Whalen, you know, this is the guy David was hanging out with in Kyoto, you know, all dressed up in his kimono and so on. And this is Gary Snyder in, in those days, you know. I mean, he's, he's still alive, although he's pretty old now. And here's Burton Watson. And, um, and D.C. Lau turns up in Kyoto, but he's not part of the fun and games, because D.C. Lau's much too serious, you know. A very wonderful scholar, and he was a friend of David's, but he was on the, on the, Sinolog, the Sinolog side of the fence, you know. I don't think he was sleeping on the floor, for example. Um, okay, well, that, that, that was, I didn't want to forget about that. Um, now, so he was, he was at home with people like Emerson, with people like Gary Snyder, and so on and so forth, Jacques Antoinette. These were the kind of people he, was, he, was, he felt comfortable with. But once, when I, the one time I actually managed to interview David on, 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 a, on, a, on a film, I made a film of it, I just said to him, you know, you ask stupid questions when you do. I said, who is the person that you admired most of all? And I was expecting him to say Arthur Whaley, right? But he didn't. He said, when you thought. I said, my goodness, that's a surprise. Out of nowhere comes the name when you thought. But of course, you see, this is all connected because when you thought was both a poet and a scholar. I mean, he, his work on the Chutsu was terribly important to David, but he was also a great poet and a translator. So that, there's a clue there, you know, I, I'm searching for clues, you see. I'm trying to excavate the reasons why he ended up doing such a fantastic job. 
and, and here was the man he admired. And of course, he was very fond of, of, of my friend um, uh, Ye Su. And Ye Su used to come and visit my house in France. And I searched and searched. I got photographs of him sitting outside talking to David for hours and hours. They just sat and talked for hours and hours and hours because they, were, they had so much in common. And he, um, they got on like a house on fire because he liked this. He liked the company of poets, you know. And he found the company of sinologists that's really rather boring. Um, and he also became very friendly with the poet Gu Chan, who was a friend of mine in New Zealand. And one evening they sat up through the night writing poems to each other in Chinese. It was an amazing occasion. Gu Chan would write a little poem and pass it across the table to David, and he'd write a reply in Chinese. So, you know, he was a very playful individual when he was in a good mood. And then in Oxford, in Oxford, his friends, you know, his, his close friends were people like Iris Murdoch and her husband, John Bailey. You know, I mean, she became famous because of the, of the memoir that John Bailey wrote, which was made into a movie with um, Judy Dench and who plays the young Iris Murdoch? Oh, Kate Winslet, that's right. I remember uh, talking to David after, the, after he watched the movie and he said, you know, because Kate Winston is always taking her clothes off in the movie. And he said, Iris never did that. Iris never. Iris just used to swim in her dress, you know. But I mean, of course, for the movie, Kate Winston had to be a bit more kind of sexy. But they were, they were great friends. And, um, and one of his, this is a very bad photograph, but I had to put it up there because one of the people that David mentioned again and again was a colleague of All Souls called Robbins Dana. And um, he talked about him as a very interesting man who was interested in, he was a professor of Eastern religions, the Spalding professor, the guy made squash balls, but he left the money to found a chair in Eastern religions. And Zainer was the guy who held that chair. And, and David talked about him a lot. Um, and I always thought he must have been just a, a very interesting person. He was interested in mysticism and Oriental religions. And he and David, he was the one person David liked talking to at All Souls College. I later discovered that actually Robert Zayner was a spy, I mean Robin, he was, he was called Robin even though his name was Robert, but it turned out he was a terribly important spy in the Middle East because his knowledge of Persian and so on was un unmatched. And uh, someone, a friend of mine who's an investigative journalist put me onto this. I mean Zayner was largely responsible for some of the big political events in the Middle East. And, um, and had a huge amount of influence. I don't think David even knew that, but he was very fond of Zena. And in fact, he dedicated the second volume of the story of the stone to Zena. He didn't put his name, he just said for RCZ. And that's Robin Zena. And um, I'll, try, I'll try not to go too fast, but I have to move along because time is moving ahead. Now, um, there's a very interesting section in the novel when um, a very important development when um, um, Jabayu's um, sister Tan Chun writes to him suggesting that they form a poetry club and of course the poetry club then becomes one of the central things in the novel you know um, and poetry clubs are a wonderful institution but um, in, the, in order to introduce this new topic um, the author has a very clever idea which is he has two letters one letter from Tan Chun to her brother to, to Bayu beautifully written letter in impeccable Chinese and then followed up on the next page by an extremely badly written letter by, by a cousin called Jia Yun, who's a pretty scoundrel, really. And, who, and, and David, David thinks about how to translate these two letters. And um, it's very interesting because it comes in, um, it comes in his notebook. And, um, and in fact, in the notebooks, you have the draft translations of the two letters. And, and in, 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 at the very back of the notebooks, you may not have seen these notebooks, but they're, they're a very wonderful document. They were the notes that he kept while he was translating. And um, at the very back, he, um, he actually writes the draft of the, of the translations. And, um, and then earlier on in the notebooks, on, on the day of October 1972, he discusses, as if talking to himself, he says, the question of style in Tantron's letter in, 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 in this chapter. I think I'll try and stand up. Um, the question of style in Tantrum's letter, chapter 37. Verse would have done if, um, if, it, if then, if, it, if, if, there were, if there were the problem of contrast with Jia Yun's letter. The trouble with a euphuistic um, 
uh, something uh, would be that Tantrum's letter is too would then become ridiculous. Now you see, he's trying to think, he's thinking aloud to himself, how shall I translate this very elegant letter written by Tantrum? And euphuism, euphuistic means extremely ornate English, and he chooses not to do that. Um, so whereas it is only meant to be mildly comic, he didn't want to make her letter seem ridiculous. He just wanted it to be, it's supposed to be mildly comic. Tantrum is not Don, Ar Don Armado. Well, I mean, he just tosses off that sentence like you're supposed to know who Don Armado is. It's obvious, I mean, I'm afraid I'm not as nearly as well informed about Shakespeare as, as, as David was. Don Armado, it turns out, I did a bit of research, but I had to, um, is a very important figure in Love's Labour's Lost. And um, <clears throat> um, he's a kind of someone who talks in very, very um, sort of um, pompous and overblown prose. And um, in this, in this Yasu contrast, it's the Su that's meant to be a joke. So you see, he doesn't want the, um, he doesn't want Tantrum's letter to be too funny. He wants Jia Yun's letter, which is funny, to be the, the funny one. And it's, it's quite rare that we have him thinking about translation in this way. So it's quite interesting. Um, and um, that's Don Armado, you see. And he's, um, he's, he's, quite an, he's quite a funny character, one of Shakespeare's most witty characters. And this is one of his speeches where he has a long monologue, you see. And I'm not going to read it because I haven't got time, but um, I'll leave it to you to do that. Um, so, so it's kind of interesting that, um, and here's the, here's the draft, you see. And, um, Uh, this is this is also from the draft. I'll have to move on. I could I could talk about that for another 15 minutes, but I really must move on. Um, now, sometimes David had to admit defeat because you know you can't always be brilliant. I mean, you can be brilliant a lot of the time, but you can't be brilliant all of the time. And and I remember he wrote somewhere that if he'd been a bit cleverer, he'd have thought of how to translate um, this character. Uh, who's, who's a, he's a very minor character. He's actually the uncle of the Jia Yun we just mentioned from chapter 37. But this comes in chapter 24. And his, this is his Chinese name, you see. But, but, but luckily, thanks to the comments by, by Zhu and Jia, we know that this is, actually means this, Tao Bushu. Tao Bushu the Ren. He's a pretty lousy character. And I think David once jokingly wrote, I couldn't find where in one of his introductions. Of course, if I'd been really clever, I would have, I would have, um, I would have called him hardly human, right? Because that's what this means, right? But you see, <laughs> there's a limit to what you can do. I mean, you know, and I dare say that, um, you know, there are lots of other things you could have done. But he, he just gave up, he just called him Bushri, and he just called him B-U-S-H-I hyphen R-E-N. Because, you know, sometimes you just have to admit defeat, you know, that's all there is to it. Um, now, and this is where you can see in the Jian Jack, in the Gung Chen Ban, you see, this is the guy, he, he hears his name, you see, Wu Shi Lin. And, and, and good old Jian Jai says, you know, um, he gives the game away, he says, Wu Shi Lin. He tells us, because Jian Jai was in on the secret, you know, he was a member of the family, we don't know whether it was a man or a woman or what, but um, he knew the secrets, I mean, they used to probably drink together, he and the author, if the author was Sa Se Chin, who I'm not even sure it was, um, they used to, he knew, all, he knew a lot of inside secrets about the book. Just like I know some inside secrets about the translation, you see. I'm a kind of, I sometimes think I'm a sort of Red Inkstand to David Sa Se Chin. I'd rather be Red Inkstand than Gao Le, but I mean, I'm stuck with being Gao Le, you see. Um, <laughs> anyway, this is, um, this is another, I mean, I'm going to whiz through these because they're all interesting examples and they all add up to a picture. You see, uh, very early on in chapter one, when we finally get into the story of Jin Shi Yin and his, his little girl, Ying Lian, and she's taken out by the servant to, um, to, to, to look at all the festivities of, of, of this Yuan Chao Jia Jie. And um, David calls it 15th night. Now, the, the Yang Xian Yin Glad is called it the Merry Festival of Lanterns, Yo Ho Ho. Well, David thought he'd try and do something a bit different from that. So he calls it, the, he calls it 15th night. Now, what's he doing there? Um, you see, I call this cultural sleight of hand. Those of you who came to my lectures over the years have got used to this expression. It's a, it's a trick he's playing. He's using his own culture, you see, to act as a kind of rather dangerous pedestrian bridge to get you over to the other one. Because we, in, in English, 
tradition, we have Twelfth Night. You know? And of course, once again, Shakespeare rears his ugly head because, of course, one of Shakespeare's most famous plays is called Twelfth Night. And David's, David's basically saying, in China, that the last day of the, of the festival season of New Year is called Fifteenth Night. Of course, the Chinese don't call it Fifteenth Night at all. But he, he calls it Fifteenth Night as a shorthand way of saying to his readers, it's just like Twelfth Night. On Twelfth Night, you do various things. You take down your Christmas decorations, and you, you know. And so he's playing a game. I mean, another secret, another little game here. And of course, Yang Xianyi, a very lovely man, but he wasn't playing games. He just gives you a very straightforward. Um, and you see, David also said that the, the little girl went out to see the lanterns and the mummers. Now, the mummers, that's a very English tradition, you know. Mummers and Morris dancing, it's terribly, terribly English. And, you know, the purists would say, how can you possibly talk about China having mummers, you know? But I mean, David would say, go, go and get lost, go to hell. I'm going to say mummers if I want to. Then you, then you try and stop me. And he did. And I mean, it, it's, it's pretty outrageous, but it's, it's fantastic. And then there was a servant, you see, whose who's Chinese name, oh, oh, God, what am I doing here? Yeah, this is another of those occasions when, you see, the servant's name in the book is, is Huo Chi. That's David's surname, Huo. And then, but then Jian Jai tells us this is short for watch. And this, this is the servant who takes the little girl out. And, and while she, he goes off to have a pee around the corner. And while he does that, she's kidnapped. It's, it's the beginning of all the disasters that befall this poor girl. So, you know, Tsar Sutin was playing with words. So he was saying that this is the beginning of disaster, you see. So David, you know, comes up with a name. He calls the servant Calamity. Well, you know, Calamity is a perfectly good English name. The famous Calamity Jane was one of Wild Bill Hickok's sidekicks. And um, so not only is Calamity the meaning of the, of the name, it, all, it also happens to be a very good English name, like Felicity or Verity. You know, there was a fashion for these kind of names. Um, OK, the next thing uh, is, again, Shakespeare. Now, um, there's a very interesting um, preface written by the author. It's not really part of the book. It comes before, in which he talks about how he came to write for my mum. And he says, literally, um, you know, one by one I, I compared them and I, I, I felt that their, their way of life and their understanding was way above my level. They were like, Shu yi wo zhi shang. And he wo tang tang xi mei, cheng bu ruo bi qin zai zai. So, and then he's saying, you know, how am I, this rather pretentious sort of grown up man with, you know, whiskers and so on, I'm just not, as good as them, you know. That's one of his great themes in the novel is that men are simply not as good as women, you know, which is probably very correct. Um, and David translated it like this. Um, as I went over them one by one, examining them and comparing them in my mind's eye, that's such a great choice of words, it suddenly came over me that those slips of girls, which is all they were then, were in every way, both morally and intellectually, superior to the grave and mustachioed senior. I am now supposed to have become. Now, for years, I just hadn't, I didn't have any idea what he was doing there, you know, until I, I stumbled across it. You know, I really feel like Sherlock Holmes here because it's, it's a quotation from Othello, you see. Um, in, in Othello, Act 1, Scene 3, um, Othello is talking to the, the nobleman of, of Venice, and he says, Most potent, grave, and reverend seniors. I mean, it's great. You've at least got the two words great. The mustachio bit was added by David. So he's just throwing in a little, a little casual reference to, to, to Shakespeare, just for the hell of it, just for the fun of it, you know? And it's brilliant. It's an absolute stroke of genius. Um, now, this is, this is the one I particularly like, because <laughs> frankly, this would make him fail any exam in translation. And he would be delighted to fail. It would be considered by him to be a great honor. Now, there's a wonderful passage. It's, it, it's, it's, it's a party. It's a party given by one of Bai Yu's friends called Feng Ziying, who's a real fun-loving guy. He gives good parties. And he invites all his mates along, and Bai Yu comes and so does Xie Pan. But also in the company was this young lady called, called Nua Zhevs. Her, her Chinese name was Yunar, Yun meaning cloud, right? Yunar. And, and David calls her Nuages because he called all the, all the actresses and sing song girls, he called them, um, what's happened to my little red eye David? He called them all by French names. So he called her Nuages. And, and the Chinese simply said, Jin Chang Yen, the Ji Yu, Yunar. 
and he says, New Archer is a girl from the budding grove, a high class establishment specializing in female entertainment. Well, that's all that, what they call it. Um, in, uh, it's a footnote, an incorporated footnote. But why, why budding grove? You know, for years I couldn't think what he was doing because that wasn't in budding grove at all. And Yang said he calls it embroidered, embroidered fragrance or something, you know, like a Chinese restaurant, you know. Um, <laughs> it's, it's one of those sort of, you know, meaningless names that you give to restaurants and, and sing-song houses and so on. In fact, when we had a symposium in February, I called it the, I called it the budding grove, remember the other? because I just like it so. Now, why on earth did he call it the budding grove? And I couldn't think about it. And then it was about four years ago, I was my last teaching stint here in Hong Kong at Chinese Zoo. I suddenly, it suddenly clicked. These things have to click. You'll never find them out otherwise. And of course, it's a reference to um, it's a reference to Marcel Proust. So David's not only playing with Shakespeare and stuff, he's also playing with Proust. He was a big fan of Marcel Proust. He read the novel at least twice in French. He would, he, but he also liked the English translation. And um, in the English translation by Scott Moncrief, who incidentally was a school friend of Arthur Whaley's. Scott Moncrief translated Proust. He went to prep school with Arthur Whaley and said to Whaley, you'll never be any good at anything. <laughs> Whaley always remembered that. Um, now, Scott Moncrief called this third volume of Proust within a budding grove. And you see, David really liked Scott Moncrief's translation, which had come in for a lot of attacks. And people rewrote it and edited it and changed it. And now they've got a new Penguin translation. So, but David always thought Scott Moncrief was the best. And um, here's another cover within a budding grove. It's all about lovely, lovely young ladies. And the author basically sort of um, discovers the wonderful world of pretty young ladies. And um, here's the French, it's the Alombre des jeunes filles en fleurs. And um, this is the new translation that's been completely ruined. Um, <laughs> well, in the shadow of young girls in flower. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> a terrible title there. Yeah. Whereas in a budding grove was a wonderful title. And um, anyway, that wasn't going on. So David, you see, I mean, this is outrageous. He just, he just simply decides to change the name of the Jin Shang. He calls it a budding grove. And you either get it or you don't. It took me years to get it. But I mean, he's playing with the fact that he thinks that Hong Kong Mung is like Proust. He always used to say that it's a novel about memory, it's a novel, it's a novel about a young man's, you know, adventure through life and so on. And he also said, you know, there will never be a lot of readers for Hong Kong Mung because it's it's too much. It's like Proust. Proust will always have a devoted following, but it'll never be a bestseller, which is true. And and uh, the story of the stone will never be a bestseller. I can give you the figures for sales, you know. They're not impressive, I'm afraid. It doesn't sell, it's too long, it's too, you know, heavy going and at five volumes, I and mean, who's going to read it, you know? So, so he's saying all these things. He's saying, well, you know, um, the budding growth, A, is, is a secret message that Hong Kong is like Proust, right? It's about the same length. But the other message is that Solomon Cree's translation is the best one, you see, because he liked it very much. Just the same way as he preferred Whaley's tale of Genji to all the new translations of Genji. He couldn't understand why people bothered to keep translating Genji Monogatari because Whaley's translation was an absolute masterpiece. So he's, he's sending you various secret messages here. And he does that all the time. I can't bear to read the story, the story of the stone now because I keep finding secret messages on every page, you know. It's like post-its. He's got them all over the place. It's like magic mushrooms. Once you find one, you find the rest, you know. They, got, they lead you on to the next one. I shouldn't have said that, sorry. Um, <laughs> and then a few other little examples of how, how naughty he was. This is, um, famous scene after the um, after Yuan Chun comes to visit the family and all the all the young people write poems. Even even Li Wan, who's the, the widowed she's the widow of Bao Yu's brother who died. And she's hoping she can't write poetry to save her life. But she comes up with something. I don't know if I gave her a whole thing. No I didn't. But you see um, the the title of her poem in Chinese is that but David simply called it All Things Bright and Beautiful. Well, it's got nothing to do with the Chinese, but of course, All Things Bright and Beautiful was a very famous uh, children's hymn in the 19th century. Now, I can sing it for you, but I won't. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. The point being, he's telling us that Li Wan was a very 
she wasn't very well educated. She didn't really write poetry at all. She was just doing her best to produce something sort of to get by. And, and therefore, by, by calling it all things bright and beautiful, he was telling us a great deal about Li Wan. So he always had a reason for the mischief that he was doing. Um, now, another one is, again, I only, I only clicked recently, but in the very first chapter when we meet the crimson pearl flower, right? Um, this, um, you know, this Zhang Zhu Xian Cao, who is the pre-incarnation uh, version of Lin Daiyu, of course. Um, and it says that she eats the secret passion fruit, right? This is the, 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 the chin wall, it's the fruit of passion. Well, we also, there happens to be a fruit called passion fruit, so that's rather clever for a start. And then she, that's what she ate when she was hungry. And no wonder she was in so much trouble, you know, when she became a human being, poor old Lin Dayu. And she's eating the passion fruit and then drinking from the pool of sadness, you know. That's this um, the Guan Chou Shui. Now, I can't help it, inevitably, if you read the pool of sadness, you end up thinking of, I can't help it, the pool of tears. Because, of course, and of course, David was deliberately doing this because Dayu drowned in her own tears, you know. Uh, the fourth volume is actually called, in my translation, The Debt of Tears, because from a very early age she was just addicted to crying, to weeping, you know. And um, I don't think it's an accident that David chose to call it the pool of sadness, you know. Um, and this is, I'm not going to read it, I don't have time, but, you know, I suppose I shall be punished for it now by being drowned in my own tears. Well, you see, I wish I hadn't cried so much, Alice, as she swam about trying to find her way out because she'd been weeping so much that there was a pool of tears. And I'm quite sure this is a deliberate reference in David's mind. He's no longer alive, so I can't ask him if I'm right, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. And then another one. I keep finding them. It's terrible. It's becoming an addiction. Um, when, when Ying Chun writes a poem, she calls it Heart's Eve, right? And the Chinese is, oh damn, the Chinese is that. The Chinese is that, right? And it doesn't mean heart sees. But, you see, um, and this is the translation, um, who would have thought on earth such scenes to find as here refresh the heart and ease the mind? Of course, Ying Chun is not one of the great poets in the novel. But, um, and as we know, she comes to a very sad end early on in the whole of she, she She gets married off to a very unpleasant character who basically beats her up. And um, she dies a very sad death. Now, um, I never thought about this much until very recently. But of course, Heart's Eve, again, the, the most well-known reference for that happens to be um, Romeo and Juliet. Here we go again, you see. Romeo and Juliet. Yet another girl like, being told a secret message, she comes to a very sad end. And in Romeo and Juliet, you see, after the death, after the first apparent death of Juliet, because she's not actually dead, she looks like she's dead, there's a conversation that goes, you know, when Peter, he's one of, the, one of the family retainers, he says, musicians, musicians, heart's ease, heart's ease, and you, and you will have me live, play heart's ease. And, and the violinist, the fiddler says, why heart's ease? Oh, musicians, because my heart itself plays my heart is full woe. I've added the words of woe because that's the song. Play me some merry dumb to comfort me. So it's quite deliberately, again, referenced by David to this little moment in, in Romeo and Juliet. And I'm sure if I carry on, if I have the time and the lifespan to continue doing this, I'm going to find at least another 20 or 30 references to Romeo and Juliet, because that's the one. That's of all Shakespeare plays, the one that he keeps going back to, and that he knew very well. Now, um, okay. um, I'm just going to now um, very quickly go through one or two individual words, because sometimes um, sometimes David's being very, very clever and very naughty with his echoes and references, you know. But sometimes he's just very, very good at choosing words, you know. And when he calls, um, you know, this, this fairy, you know, Jing Chuan Xin Yu, he calls it a fairy disenchantment, right? Um, his choice of the word disenchantment is just such a good one. It's so powerful because she's a very important figure, of course, in the novel. She's the one who appears in the first chapter, but also in chapter five when Bayou has that dream, and she comes along and, and sort of initiates him into the whole business of love and destiny and everything. 
And uh, you know, if, you, if you just look at the people who've used this word disenchantment, the most famous is Jean-Paul Sartre, of course. And I like his one because it happens to fit our purpose. You know. Like all dreamers, I mistook disenchantment for truth. That's the kind of thing Jean-Paul Sartre would say. You know. and, um, and there are lots of other examples. But I just want to say that, um, that the way he chooses words is simply the product of his incredible reading and his in, instinctive and intense poetic sense for language. And we can't, there's nothing we can do about that. That was just something he had. We can try to achieve it, we can work hard, but he, he had it in a very, very strong degree. Um, and now I, I just, in the course of my researches into this word, this child, I discovered that this Matt Groening, he did The Simpsons, right? He's the creator of that wonderful Simpsons, which has been going for years. He's about to launch a new um, animated film for Netflix called Disenchantment, and I love the description of the plot. Um, set in a ruined medieval city called Dreamland, sounds like Hung Mung Mung, it will follow the grubby adventures of an alcoholic princess, I'm sorry, not her, her elf companion and a demon. And Groening himself has said, Disenchantment will be about life and death, love and sex, and how to keep laughing in a world full of suffering and idiots despite what the elders and wizards and other jerks tell you. So, you know, the word disenchantment is alive and well, and, and they're about to launch a major uh, movie based on that single word. Um, and then just choosing a word like, you know, um, the word writ. It's not the kind of word that you or I would use very much, but, but, but David's not afraid of using, you know, the unusual word. Um, and when he translates that famous um, poem, you know, that comes very early on in the novel, um, he, he translated, found unfit to repair the azure sky, long years a foolish mortal man was I. My life in both worlds on this stone is writ. Pray who will copy out and publish it. Now, I mean, of course, it's very handy because it rhymes with it, right? <laughs> but I mean, um, not many translators would be bold enough to use the word writ as the past, past tense of right. But it works perfectly here. And he was a very bold, very bold in his choice of words. Um, Red Reddington loved that poem, of course, and said, "This is the whole. This is the whole theme of the novel, you know." And he says, "I can hear, you know." So Reddington is really amazing, the kind of guy you would like to meet and have a drink with in the bar, because he says, "You know, oh, I can hear him sobbing now. You know, it's just wonderful." And David loved reading Reddington's comments. Now, um, and of course, it comes in. Anthony and Cleopatra, of course, the word writ comes all over the place because in those days people like to use it, so I'm not going to label the point there. Um, now, again in chapter 5, when, when the fairy first appears, she, you, the author says that you can hear someone singing on the other side of the hill, and this is what she sings. Um, this is what they hear. Tell each nymph, and, and this is, it just says, Zhong Ar Nyu, you know, Ji Yen Zhong Ar Nyu, He Bi. Mi, mi sien chok. And, and David translated, tell each nymph and swain, tis folly to invite love's pain. Well, I mean, you know, good for him, you know, because of course, nymphs and swains, I mean, I grew up on them because we used to sing madrigals at my school. And I mean, they're all over the place. For example, this is from Asis and Galatea, which was set to music by a handle. And, um, oh, the pleasure of the plains, happy nymphs and happy swains. Harmless, merry, free and gay, dance and sport the arms away. Well, I mean, for David, it would just be so easy to just come up with nymphs and swains. You know? I'm sure that Yang Sinyi probably said boys and girls. Well, I mean, boys and girls, it's all very well. You know, they might be going to play hockey, you know. Whereas nymphs and swains, you know it's all about love. And, um, and then, of course, the other thing that was always in the back of David's mind was Milton. He was a huge fan of, of Milton. He knew his Milton backwards. And then you've only got to read L'Allegra to see all this kind of language about, you know, nymphs. Haste thee, nymph, and bring with thee jest and youthful jollity. I mean, I'm not a big fan of Milton myself, but he, but David was. And, you know, um, in the same passage when he's describing this, this, this fairy, and he says, um, her glittering elegance I can compare with dragons in an ornamental mirror. Well, again, the word mirror is not exactly the kind of word you and I would use every day. I'll meet you down at the mirror. You know, you don't say that. You, it's, you usually would say the pond or something like that. You know, but the mirror, 
And as well as being useful because it kind of half rhymes with compare, happens to be a word that was greatly used by people like Walter Scott in Lady of the Lake, you know, our broad nets have swept the mere. It's got that kind of rather romantic association with David Light. Um, and here, um, when they're, when they're going, going through the gateway, and on the sides it has the words, ancient earth and sky, marble that loves passion should outlast all time. Star-crossed, here we are, star-crossed men and maids groan that love's death should be so hard to pay. Well, of course, you've only got to say star-crossed and everyone's thinking of Romeo and Juliet straight away. Um, and there we go, see? In the very, pro in the very prologue, the very first few lines of Romeo and Juliet, you see, um, from forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. So, um, another Romeo, I mean, there must be dozens of Romeo and Juliet references. Um, I like the way he chose the expression fond infatuation for chi ching. Chi ching is a nightmare to translate. I'm, I'm always being asked by people, how do you translate chi ching? You know, it's a kind of leading question. You know, the next thing they do is they tell you they love you, which is not, not really the idea. But I, mean, I would never have thought of fond infatuation. But fond is exactly the right word, yeah. Because it, it, it's, and it comes in this rather obscure novel from 1820. And then, in that same occasion, when they're writing poems for Yuan Chun, um, the young girl, Si Chun, she's the one who ends up becoming a Buddhist nun. She's not a big poet. And she, she writes a rather sweet little poem. And, um, and um, she, ends, she ends with the line, the translation ends with the line, great nature's handiwork has been outdone. And again, the, echo, the echoes of that word, handiwork, go straight back to um, the other great source, in addition to Shakespeare, of course, the other primary source for the English language is the Bible, the King James Bible. And this is the, the 19th Psalm, you see. Um, the heavens are telling the glory of God, the firmament proclaims his handiwork. And it comes in the great Haydn or oratorio, the creation of the heavens are telling the glory of God. Actually, Haydn changes the word slightly. But anyway, so, so his choice of the word, the handiwork of nature, was a deliberate echo of Psalm 19. Now, um, Lin Dayu writes a very pretty poem, because she is a good rock, she's a good poet, and she writes a very pretty poem, which he calls The Fairy, the fairy Stream, right, which is a translation of that. And um, actually, the text of this, that line is very dubious. It comes in different versions. But, um, and she, so, so David begins the translation with the words, to fairy haunts far from the world's annoy. A royal visit brings a double drug. Well, I mean, for a start, to use the word annoy there is very unusual. We don't talk about annoy in that sense nowadays in sort of current English. But it, it works very well. It also happens to rhyme with joy, which is very useful. But what about this to fairy haunts? And I couldn't find in, you know, we had to learn poetry by heart in my school. I immediately thought of this very famous poem by Tennyson called The Brook. I come from haunts of Coot and Hearn. We never knew, we never, we never, we never knew what Coot and Hearn meant. I think they're kind of water bird. Right? I make a sudden sally and sparkle out among the fern to dicker down the valley. So every schoolboy had to learn that poem by heart, you know. So when, when David talks about fairy haunts, um, I bet you, I bet you, 99% sure that he was thinking of Tennyson poem. Because everybody, we all had to learn Tennyson because it was easy. Now, this is, this is wonderful. David really liked having fun, you know. He liked a bit of bawdy. He liked a bit of, a bit of, bit of hanky-panky from time to time. And there's a great character in the novel who, who rejoices in the name um, Do Hunyan. She's called Do Hunyan because she liked to have a lot of sex, right? And she, had, she said that every man in the, in the family, right, they all sa sampled her wear. I think that's what he says. And this sentence he translates as follows, which I think is just superb. Because of her pneumatic charms. Now, nowadays, most people think pneumatic refers to those pneumatic drills, you know. And actually, it's a very good word to describe a lady with extremely large breasts, OK? She looks like they've been pumped up in a bicycle pump, you know. And um, so because of her pneumatic charms and omnivorous promiscuity, well, actually, that's a very free translation of these four words, right? This voluptuous young limmer. I mean, nobody uses the word limmer. It's in fact Scottish. And it means a sort of a young woman. 
was referred to by all and sundry as the matches. Now, he wrote to me in a letter, I'm I, I realize now I, I was terribly naughty to call him a mattress because the Chinese don't sleep on mattresses, you know. And, but, he, but basically he didn't care. He called him a mattress because he wanted to send out the secret, you know, message, everyone sleeps on them, you see, sleeps with them, on them, whatever. And, um, but then the use of pneumatic, I mean, you know, how many people know about this word pneumatic? I, I, I traced it back to T.S. Eliot, who in a poem of his called Whispers of Immortality says, uncorseted, that means without her being corset, her friendly bust gives promise of pneumatic bliss. I mean, the, for David to use the word pneumatic here, I mean, nobody's ever commented on it, but it's very, very brave and, and very naughty of him. Um, and in the same section, in, in, a, in a similar section, he's talking about a lady in the household who goes straight out to see Wang Shi Feng. And, and the Chinese is unbelievably simple. It simply says, Tian Zuo Che, like Shu Feng Jie, right? That's terribly plain. But David, he couldn't resist it. So what he does is he says, she drove incontinent forth. And most people today think incontinent refers to old men who are peeing all the time. It, it actually, if you look into the use of the word incontinent in 18th century fiction, it means straight away. It simply means without any further delay or ado. So he's, he's using an expression that was probably last used in the 18th century. And, um, you know, but he gets away with it. He gets away with everything. She drove incontinent forth to see from as fast as cab could carry her. It simply says in a, in a carriage, right? Which is probably a, probably a cart, you know, probably a donkey cart. But as fast as cab could carry her, sounds like it's out of Dickens or something like that. And in fact, um, I found the incontinent in Tristram Sandy, the great 18th century novel. And, um, and then later on in that same section, it says that, that um, Feng Jie, um, so, and he found that Si Feng had always found Joshua a pleasant, unassuming sort of body and was disposed, was disposed to help her. But you see, people nowadays don't use the word body in that sense. But this just means person. It doesn't, it doesn't mean a physical body. And uh, again, I found this in, 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 in a in very famous novel by Smollett called Humphrey Tinker. The Countess was a good sort of body. It doesn't mean she had a good figure, it just means she was a good person. So many of his usages are along those lines. And I think I've for once timed myself quite well because I want to conclude. I want to conclude by sharing with you three wonderful sort of um, I can't think quite of they evoke the highest aspirations of the translator, I'll put down my I put down the wrong thing. Sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs> I really am losing my marbles, I'm sorry. Um, so um, why did I call this in the garden of perfect freedom? Because you see David, by by brushing aside all the rules, by just following his instinct, by following his creative genius, he managed to um, turn translation into the most wonderful creative art. And he he um, he established his place in this, what I call this garden of perfect freedom. In another version of this talk, I will go further and talk about gardens in literature, but that's, that's about another four, series, four lecture series. But, um, um, so I want, to, I want to connect this spirit of creative freedom with the great Taoist classic, the Tao Te Ching, which I've just finished translating. And this comes from a commentary. It's not from the Tao Te Ching itself. It's from a commentary by uh, this wonderful man, Liu Yiming. And he, he writes here for the Taoist. And I, I, I invite you to, to substitute the word translator for Taoist. Okay? So let's, let's read it as if it's about translation. The translator sees with the vision of spirit, darkly one with the Tao of heaven and nature. The translator understands everything with the inner eye sees the Tao everywhere in everything. You could say sees Shakespeare everywhere, <laughs> sees Milton everywhere. I mean, this is the kind of translation. It's the Tao, it is the Tao of translation. To see this requires no effort, no action. I mean, David wasn't working hard to get in all this stuff. It just came pouring out by accident, just for the hell of it, you know. It just, you know, he didn't sort of do masses of research to come up with green sickness peak. He just had the idea and did it. Yeah. It requires no effort. 
no action. It is perfected in silence, in true union with the Tao. So I, I think it's a wonderful, um, applied to translation, sums up perfectly the kind of the spirit of his, of his creative translation. Um, and this, of course, is terribly famous, but it can always bear rereading. This is from the preface to the King James Bible. How shall men meditate in that which they cannot understand? How shall they understand that which is kept close in an unknown tongue? It's all about translation, you see. Translation it is that openeth the windows and letteth in the light, that breaketh the shell, that we may eat the kernel, that pulleth aside the curtain, that we may look into the holy place, that removeth the cover of the well, that we may come by water. And in those days they knew how to write English. My God, no wonder people still read the authorized version of the Bible. And Shakespeare, of course, because they were contemporaries. And um, when you read a paragraph like that, you just weep at the fact that we can't, you know, now we live in a world where government is done by tweets, you know, where people can't even spell or, or grammar's gone out the window. And uh, this is real English, you know. But it also happens to be about the, the highest aspirations of translation, which lets in the light, you know. Without it, there is no light. And it's a most inspiring paragraph. Every time I read it, I, I, I find it very inspiring. And then, this brings us to perfect freedom, because there's a very famous prayer by St. Augustine, who's a very interesting figure. And we, we had to read this, I think we had this prayer read at least twice a week at my school. And so it's been echoing in my mind ever since. And I think to apply it to a translator like Black Hawks is so apt because he's accused by many critics of being so free, you know, so um, outrageously um, unfaithful, you know. Unfaithful is the word that they use about him because he just takes liberties, you know, terrible liberties. But my goodness, as a result, he succeeds amazingly in creating a, a literary masterpiece. And he does, he exercises his right to freedom because he is the willing slave of the author. He, he never doubts for one moment that Tsai Sui Chen or whoever it was who wrote the novel gives him complete carte blanche to do whatever he likes. Because in his heart of hearts, he is the same person, you know. One could say he's the reincarnation of that person. So he doesn't need to have a license. You know, he doesn't need a translator's license. You know. No one's going to come up to him and say, can I see your license? You know, are you licensed to translate? You know, and, so, and this is the point of St. Augustine, which I think says it all. Eternal God, who are the light of the minds that know you. It's also from the original Book of Common Prayer. So it's from the same time, the translation is from the same time as, as the King James Bible. Eternal God, who are the light of the minds that know you the joy of the hearts that love you, and the strength of the wills that serve you. Grant us so to know you that we may truly love you, and so to love you that we may fully serve you, whom to serve is perfect freedom. Now that is the most amazing prayer, um, even if you're not a Christian, which I'm not. Because it's saying that if, if in your heart of hearts you know, if in your heart of hearts you, you know, you truly love, in, the, in this case you truly love the work of literature, which is this great masterpiece from my mom, and you're willing to serve it, you see. You, you can fully serve it because you have the love. And as a result, to serve that masterpiece is in fact perfect freedom. Thank you. That's a big bit for your very learned talk. Um, I'd like to raise two questions if you don't mind. Uh, first, I was just wondering if you have ever translated uh, over the years from uh, English and Chinese. Secondly, uh, which, uh, at the very highest level, I was just wondering uh, which you would consider more challenging, a Chinese speaker translating into English or an English speaker translating into Chinese? Thank you. Could you repeat the first question? I didn't quite catch it. Did you say, have I ever translated into Chinese? Yes. No. Okay, that's very easy. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I would, I would never dream of doing so. <laughs> um, and I think you're right. There are very, 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 very few people have tried. Um, Robert Morrison, of course. Um, very, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the great missionary Robert Morrison, who compiled the first monumental dictionary of the Chinese language into English. Um, he, he 
who labored for many years on a Chinese translation of the Bible. Thank, thank you. Um, and I happen to have a, a facsimile copy of his translation of the New Testament sitting on my dining table when David Hawkes came to visit. And he picked it up and he went off and started reading it and he just he just said to me, my goodness, this chap writes bad Chinese, um, which of course is a bit, a bit of a sad thing to say because Morrison tried terribly hard. But um, I think um, I think Matteo Ricci, you know, the Jesuit scholar, he was one of the very few people who really acquired a superb command of classical Chinese. And he did, he wrote books in Chinese, which were partly paraphrasing and partly translating Western works. So I don't think it's impossible, but I, I really can't think of many people who are capable of doing it. I mean, it's very, very hard to acquire a good prose style in Chinese if you're a foreigner. And I, I'm not sure I can think of more than maybe one or two examples. I certainly never dared to try, nor did David. And I think that, um, to move on to your second question, which is kind of linked to it, um, um, why do people, why do Chinese people get away with translating into English? But English people don't get away with translating into Chinese, okay. Um, first of all, Chinese is a fiendishly difficult language, you know. I mean, I'm still a student of the Chinese language, and I'm you know, nearly 72 years old, and I still have to have recourse to dictionaries, and you know, um, it's so hard. And there are very few people who take the time and are prepared to acquire the kind of self-cultivation, the kind of sunan that enables them to translate from Chinese. That's why there are so many opportunities around for Chinese people to translate into English, because there simply aren't enough English speakers available who have the skills. You know? So that's a kind of looking at it from a market point of view. Um, and I do think that there have been some remarkable Chinese translators who've worked into English. There have also been some very, very bad ones. I'm not going to start giving names because I don't want. I want to get asked Hong Kong alive. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I mean, there, are, there really are. And some, I think that one of them, he's known by his initials as X Y Z. That gives you a clue. But, um, um, but um, you see, Yang Xianyi, whose English was very, very good, he did a, a complete English degree at Oxford, and he spoke impeccable English. And he was a very lovely man. Um, but everything he did was went through the hands of his wife, Gladys, you know. She was a native speaker. So, I mean, um, you know, my, my very first um, lecture, I did talk quite a bit about collaboration, and I think that a lot, of, a lot of this problem is solved through collaboration. When you have a, in the case of Yang Tian Yi, he would nearly always do the first draft into English, and then Gladys would come along and, and just correct a few mistakes, and. You know, I mean, Lin Yutang, whose English was pretty good, he makes mistakes on every page, you know. Mistakes of idiom, mistakes of grammar, I mean, and the famous case of Zhang Ailin, you know, Zhang Ailin thought she could write superb English. And I once had the misfortune to edit one of her contributions to renditions, because I was working at renditions, and she sent in two chapters of her translation of Hai Shang Hua Lie Zhuan. And she thought she was wonderful, but I, I was given them them to correct by my, my boss, Stephen Sum. So I did a job, I just did my job. I corrected her English. And when it was sent back to China, she was furious because she thought her English was perfect, you see. And who's this young idiot who's correcting my English? We had a terrible time um, trying to calm her down because she really thought she could write better English than I could. Um, anyway, and there have been many cases like that. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's ever going to be very satisfactory. I mean, if you look at the kind of things I've been talking about today, it requires a lifetime's acquaintance with the Chinese tradition, you know, to be able to just conjure up those things out of, out of nowhere, and as the way, the way Hawkes did. I mean, he, all his life, you know, he was not only working on his Chinese, he was also building up a fantastic um, memory, a repertoire of, of books he read. I mean, he could read, if he read Dickens, he read all of Dickens, all the novels, and he remembered every plot. He could remember all the details of every Dickens plot. I mean, that's it's staggering. When I read a novel, I usually forget the plot before I get to the end. I, I, I certainly can't remember it afterwards. I'm, very, I'm a very bad reader in that respect. I have to make a big effort. Um, he had an extraordinary memory for the books he read. And, and he read voraciously, and he was always reading. That was his inner life, you know. That was, that was what fed him, that's what kept him alive. 
and he read like he wrote, like he translated, he read with, with a passionate intensity, you know. And he loved performing books, he loved reading them to his children. When he was at school, he wanted to go on the stage and be an actor. He liked to perform, you know. And, and, and um, you know, to go back to your question, that would be so hard for a, for a Chinese-speaking person to, to achieve that degree of, of, of confidence and fluency in a non non-native language. It's very, very rare. I mean, honestly, most of the good results have been through collaboration, such as Sienese and Gladys's or um, Jiang Kang Hu and Wizard Binner, to give two examples. There are lots of others. Um, you get these frightful pretentious people like Gu Hong Ming. You know, Gu Hong Ming thought his English was absolutely fantastic. But have a look at his translation of the Da Xie or the Zhong Yong or the Lun Yu. It's just quaint, you know. It's very, it's good, it's like something from a museum, it's got no life to it. It's, it's very amusing, it's very interesting, because Gu Hong Ming was a very interesting character, but um, it's not a good translation, it's just not. Because he, he was a, you know, to the bitter end, he was a, a die-hard Chinese nationalist, and he, he, he believed in, in the superiority of his own language, and um, that's not going to work, you know. Mm. I don't think I have anything more to say about that. I was wondering, John, how many um, languages could David read? And secondly, I wonder, are there any references um, from Cervantes, from Don Quixote in the... In the oh, David read, David read Don Quixote in Spanish, for a start, okay. Um, and probably there are, I just don't know Don Quixote well enough. He read Dante in Italian. He read Thomas Mann in German. He read Balzac in French. That's just for starters. He also read Latin and Greek. Um, he knew Japanese. I mean, the man was phenomenal, you know. And he, he just, he would learn Italian specifically in order to read Dante. I mean, I've got his copy of Dante, you know. And um, actually, he only got through the first volume. When you get to the second and third, he hasn't even cut the pages, so you can tell he gave up. But he did read, I know he read, and he started learning Portuguese because he really liked him. I can't remember his name now, that Portuguese novelist who got the Nobel Prize. Uh, anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, he was phenomenal. I mean, his gift for languages was quite uncanny. And of course, in the Second World War, they put him to use as a, as a trainer of code breakers, you know, for Japanese, trying to break the Japanese codes, because he had that sort of extraordinary um, mental um, agility, you know. He could dance from one language to another, and it's quite phenomenal, yeah. Was that, was that all professional? Was he good at crosswords? Um, well, I don't think he particularly did crosswords. I mean, he, but he was very clever at working out things like the rules of Chinese regulated octets, like Lu Shu, which are really like crossword puzzles. You know? I mean, Du Fu was really the world's most distinguished crossword puzzle writer. You know? The way he structured the tonal variations, all this. Thing. But to my memory, I mean, my grandfather did the crossword puzzle every morning. The Times got to the puzzle, and he always finished it exactly at 10:27 every day for his life, including the very last day of his life, he died having completed the Times crossword puzzle. And the guy at Oxford who did Times did the crosswords was Ray Dawson. Ray Dawson, who was David's number two and they never got on, Ray Dawson actually set the crosswords for the Times. He was one of their regular crossword puzzle guys. And Ray, if only got to compare David with Ray, and I mean, it's just worlds apart, you know. Ray taught me classical Chinese. He, he thought us, anyway, let's not get on to Ray Dawson, that's not really right. But that's because of the crossword question. Yeah. I don't think David particularly did crosswords. Um, he liked playing games, he liked playing card games and things like that. And he always cheated. And, um, <laughs> well, not always, he sometimes cheated. Yeah. Anybody want to write an extra chapter for Hong Lam Mung? <laughs> I'm not going to mention your chapter, don't worry. Um, but then, I mean, there have been so many, um, you know, sequels to Hong Lam Mung. It's very interesting. There's about 50 of them because everybody wanted to write more. Because once you get to the end, you feel oh, you can't, you can't stop there. You've got to have another one. And recently, I, I discovered this wonderful um, sequel written by a Mongol, a Mongol prince called Injanasi. He was a Hong Lam Mung fanatic. He, tried, 
He translated about 1830. He translated Hong Long into Mongolia. And not content with that, he wrote a sequel. And it's been translated back into Chinese and published um, uh, by a very enterprising scholar in Paris called Chen Qinghao. And it's a sort of mildly erotic novel, well, actually more than mildly erotic, but it, the first two chapters are the only bit I've read in Chinese translation, in which somehow he manages to bring Dao Yu back to life. And um, she and Zhao Yu finally actually had physical contact. How can I put this politely? They actually they had a sexual encounter. And um, it's, I must say, when I read that, I had a huge sense of relief because after all those 120 chapters and the poor girl still dies a virgin, you feel, you know, there must be more to the story than that. And this novel was simply called Meng Hung Er Meng, right? So it's a kind of dream within a dream. And this book, this book has that effect on people. People always want to add to it. They want to write a bit more and they want to bring it up to date or they want to change the ending. Or It's, it's unlike any other book. People become quite obsessed with it, you know. I have to admit, I am myself, I'm completely obsessed with it. And whenever, you know, whenever, you know, life is too hard, I just go back to Hong Kong Mom, because there it is. Nobody can take it away. It's right there. It's a living universe. And you can go back to it time and time and again. You can go back to the different stages in your life, you know, when you're young, when you're middle-aged, when you're old. And um, as a, a former student of mine so memorably said years ago, that she reads Hong Kong Mom in the summer to keep cool, and she reads it in the winter to keep warm. It's a kind of air conditioning system, you see. It's very, I thought that was a very profound literary judgment, you see. And it's that sort of, because it's not a book, it's, it's a life, it's a living thing. And David responded to that by producing a living translation. That's what it boils down to. You know. It's alive. Uncanny, it's uncannily alive, both in English and in Chinese. So it's a very hard act to follow. I mean, when I had to do the last 40 chapters, I mean, I've never quite recovered from it because you don't step into someone's shoes like that, you know. Any more comments or questions? I mean, I've kept you up. Yes, my dear, in the front row here. wrote in a book review of uh, Hawke's translation that um, she knew Hawke's um, had to learn Welsh when he was having trouble in, tr uh, no, I mean, when he felt uh, very stressed in translating um, the book. So um, did you remember um, Hawke's telling you about learning Welsh in order to translate the and I think someone got the wrong end of the stick there, oh, but anyway, carry on. Yeah. Um, I, I suppose it was correct. So the question in my mind was um, whether or not you think sometimes trying to find these kind of stimuli or something that is not really, um, you won't, uh, at first sight, you won't think they are related, but mm. um, do you think you said um, translating, uh, at least um, it should be effortless if you have uh, read enough into a lot of things. But when you have to overcome some barriers, and um, did you find any habit of finding something that seemingly uh, is not related to your task, but turn it turns out that habit or those kinds of trying to tap into different resources would be quite helpful. Mm. Sorry, sometimes when questions are so long, I can't remember what, how it started. <laughs> I think I remember you mentioned you tried to find a link between Welsh and... No, I mean, David learned Welsh because he went to live in Wales. And he mainly studied Welsh after he'd finished translating one of them. There was no connection. He didn't sort of go and do Welsh in order to get more inspiration with it, no. He, he learned Welsh because he was living in Wales and he didn't want to be thought of as an outsider. But actually the Welsh people refused to speak Welsh to him, they always spoke English, which always upset him. Um, I think that on a, on, a, on a wider level, yes, it's always good to get away from what you're doing 
and not sort of sit hunched up over your desk trying to struggle with the next word. You know, David often would find that he couldn't get a rhyme, for example, because he was great, he used rhyme a lot. And he'd go down to his garden, he had a vegetable garden, and dig the, dig the potato patch or something. And as he was digging, he, he often said the rhyme would just come to him because he was more relaxed and it's no good struggling in that way. I don't think I ever said that you should be effort, that the translation was effortless. Of course, at its very highest level, it's, it's inspired and it's, it's effortless in that way. I think there's an enormous amount of work involved and a lot of effort. Um, but um, I do think that um, you have to find all sorts of um, little tricks to get yourself out of a rut, you know. People tend to sit down and with a dictionary and they're just translating, you know, it's a disastrous idea. I often tell my students the first rule for a translator is not to translate, you know. It's just don't sit down at your desk and just translate, you know. Go for a walk, go and listen to music, go for a swim, whatever, uh, or just, um, you know, um, read, a, read a good book, you know. I mean, um, because often you just get stuck, you know, your mind gets into a kind of rut and you're just not going to get out of it. So there are all sorts of things. I mean, a good bottle of whiskey is sometimes a start. But that's not necessarily to be advised to young people. And, and um, I gave up drinking whiskey some years ago. So I did use to translate quite a lot, um, having consumed large amounts of alcohol. I found that the result the next morning was never very good, you know. You think it's good at the time because you're completely drunk. But actually, if you go back and look at it the next morning, it's often it's terrible. And you know, some people try drugs and so on. So I don't advise any of those routes myself. Um, I think each individual has to find their own form of, um, of getting out of the rut. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not exactly. You know, I wouldn't prescribe any any particular um, solutions to anybody. I think you have to find them to yourself, basically. But no, Welsh was never his route to Chinese. In fact, he more or less gave up Chinese when he studied Welsh. He wanted to just get rid of it, you know. He was sick and tired of it, actually. But then he came back later on, he rediscovered it. Later on, he, he took a break. He took quite a long break from Chinese, and that's when he was learning Welsh. Hmm. So I don't know who, told, who wrote that, but they got it wrong. They just didn't get it wrong, you know. I'd like to read whatever it was you came across, because maybe I should write to that person and Put them straight here. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Oh. Hi, John. Uh, it is believed that language become obsolete in every 40 or 50 years. Is it necessary to retranslate Hanlongo in another 20 years? Because it was published for almost about 40 years. A second, do you have any other plan to translate, uh, to have a big project? translating other Chinese classics? <laughs> oh dear. Um, listen, I really have no idea. I mean, I, I guess there'll be another translation one day, but that's fine. I think this one has a bit of life left in it. It's still, luckily we didn't write a very colloquial, it wasn't very, uh, even when it came out, it wasn't particularly um, modern. It, it's a sort of timeless style that's written in. could have been written a hundred years ago, really, or, or maybe, and, and I think it's, it seems to have lasted quite well. I don't feel annoyed by it in the video. But you know, someone may come along and do a better one. Who knows? Um, in turn, you ask me about my own plans. Well, funnily enough, I have, in recent days, um, decided to try my hand at a new translation of that long novel, Shrekul Dran, because I feel it's time for me to do something completely different from Hong 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 is so sentimental, it's all about feelings. And I'd like to do something with a bit of action, you know, a bit of blood and guts, you know, a bit of violence, and, you know. Um, I think, of course, Shrek Rutan is always very popular with the Japanese, as you know. Um, and I thought I'd have a go at that, because I did spend years translating one of Jin Yong's Wu Xiao Xiao Chuo. So I've done a bit of preparatory work, in a sense, because all of Jin Yong's work, in a sense, comes from that tradition of, um, goes right back to Shrek Rutan. So the answer to that second question is, yes, I'm probably going to have a go at Shrek Rutan, but I, you know, I'm retired now, so I'll just take it easy. Play with my dogs. You know. Hello, 
um, I want to ask, is there, is there anything uh, we, the new learner in translation can modify uh, maybe your work or what we should more care about? Oh my goodness, um, as a young translator, what should you care about? Um, oh dear, I'm starting to sound like some sort of, you know, Oprah Winfrey or something. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to come up here and share your life experience? <laughs> I think you should live, you know. I don't, I, I, I've said that several times in these lectures. I think that, you know, when young translators come up to me and say, I'm translating D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover into Chinese, can you give me some advice? Well, I mean, I frankly, the kind of advice I'd give would not be a very good thing to say in this public um, forum. I think if you're translating D.H. Lawrence, you probably have to experience the kind of things D.H. Lawrence experienced. Um, and uh, I think that if you translate, um, you know, whatever, Proust, you have to learn to live like Proust. But basically, you have to be prepared to live and, 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 and be a bit enterprising and adventurous and read, of course. I mean, I don't just mean live physically, but live in your imagination and broaden your horizons, listen to good music, um, feel the great artists of the world in your life and, um, and share that, allow them to share their lives with you. And don't worry too much about language. Of course, language is, is you've got to learn language. You have to work very hard at your own language and stuff. Don't think you just have to learn about the foreign language. You have to learn about your, your native tongue because that's what you're using. That's the tool you're using. And so many would-be translators, they think, oh, because I was born a Chinese speaker, I can write good Chinese. That's nonsense, you know. Nobody is born a good writer. I mean, you have to learn to be a good writer and, and copy the examples of good writers around you. And um, it's a lifelong task, you know, it really is. I mean, uh, it's, it doesn't stop. Um, and you learn, make mistakes, it's great to make mistakes. And I always used to give my students extra marks for going making mistakes because unless you make mistakes, you never learn, you know. And um, you might do a translation, do the whole thing wrong, you know, but it doesn't matter. You'll go on to do something better next time. Um, I have a student in China who translated Chinese poetry into Shakespearean sonnets. They were terribly bad, full of grammatical mistakes, but I gave him very high marks for being so brave and so completely crazy as to do something like that. He translated Dufu into sort of Shakespearean sonnet form using a ancient words and stuff. I just thought, wow, good on you, you know, and that uh, gave him very high grades. Um, he was very surprised, of course. Um, but, um, you know, that's the kind of thing. Do something completely crazy, you know. Go off, travel around the world, I don't know. I'm not going to give you the kind of answers you want, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, thank you very much for the lecture first. Uh, you mentioned that uh, we need a lot of reading to make us a good translator, just like uh, how uh, Derek did. Um, uh, he has a very large repertoire of uh, readings. But given that we are not as talented, as, <laughs> we don't have uh, that extraordinary talent like him, uh, how could how could we start uh, building up our uh, repertoire of readings? Well, it's, it's, I don't think there's much to say about it. I mean, you just have to, I mean, you just, you will become a better reader the more you read, you know. I mean, I remember once, I don't I think it was actually Robert Hightower who said this, who I showed you the picture of, David's friend at Harvard who really said the only way to learn to read Chinese poetry is just to keep reading more and more Chinese poems. Because as you read more, you become familiar with the way they write, the way they think. So you just have to keep on, keep on keeping on, you know, and just read more. I mean, don't be, I, 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 don't be afraid. Don't, don't say, oh, this guy is so brilliant, I can never be like that, you know, and then give up. I mean, we can all, we can all learn, we can all become better readers. It's within your power, you know. You just have to be determined to get there. It's like you undertake a course of study. You know, maybe you want to study medicine. Medicine's terribly hard to study. You know, I think most people would give up after the first week. My daughter studying medicine. You know, and every, every almost every day I listen to her saying how hard it is because, you know, when I compare the study of medicine to the study of the humanities, 
the standards they set are so high, you know. But the thing is, if you're determined to learn, you will, you will overcome those difficulties. If you're determined to become a doctor, you will, you will work really hard to understand the human body, even though it seems very, very difficult and very demanding and very discouraging. But you will persevere because you really want to. Now, if you really want to become a better reader, you will, you will become one because you have that determination. And you will seek out, you will seek out those books that really speak to you. You know, they may not be the great masterpieces. You may like some other things, you know. I particularly enjoy reading historical fiction. I like reading Walter Scott, stuff like that. M most of my friends think it's terrible. They can't bear it, you know. I really enjoy it. That's the kind of thing, I, uh, when I was young, I read a lot of novels by the German novelist Hermann Hesse, you know, which are all translations from German. But they spoke to me at my particular age. They were all about young men having different crises of, you know, in their lives, and it's about art and music and love. And I, I read all those novels, I just devoured them because they were what I was looking for. So depending on you, depending on what you like, you know, you might want to read different kinds of things. Keep reading the stuff that speaks to you. Don't just read for the sake of it. Read what really speaks to you. If you enjoy reading um, you know, romantic fiction, read romantic fiction. If you enjoy reading history, read history. If you enjoy reading um, you know, and biographies, biographies of people. That's a fascinating kind of reading too, about real lives, about what goes on in people's lives. I find that fascinating. Um, you know, just read, keep, keep, keep varying what you read, but always keep following the stuff that really, you know, it's like some people enjoy eating, you know, mapo um, tofu, some people enjoy eating, you know, something else. It's what you enjoy. Read for enjoyment. Read what you enjoy, you know. Read what your taste dictates to you, you should be reading. And then you will find it, it, it kind of nourishes you. It gives you a further taste to, to read more, you know. Don't, don't regard it too much as a duty. It should be a pleasure. It should be something you do for the sheer pleasure of it. And if, and if a book isn't, I mean, I, I very often start a book and give it up after 10 pages, because I just stop enjoying it, you know. And sometimes I persevere a bit more, because I feel, I feel a sense that maybe there's something coming up that's going to be good. So I keep going for 20 pages, and then maybe I still give up, you know, because I only want to read the stuff that I really enjoy, some stuff that really is meaningful to me, you know. Um, and it's often quite surprising, you know, what really you enjoy, because we don't know ourselves very well. You, know, you may not know what you really enjoy, you know, but you have to explore and you have to explore and take advice from other people. Ask other people, what are you reading, you know? There used to be, I had a wonderful boss in, in, in a job, a previous job, who used to write emails to his staff every week. He was American. And he said, hi guys, because they always say hi guys in America. Hi guys, this week I'm reading, you know, whatever, whatever. It's a really good book. And if you'd like to walk down to the lake with me, we can share our thoughts. Now I like that, you know. He was regarded as being a bit wacky, you know. But I mean, he was wanting to share his pleasure in reading with other people, with his colleagues. And um, that's a very old-fashioned attitude. Nowadays, it's all online or something. And um, I suppose I'm very prejudiced. I would say, read books. Don't read stuff online, you know. I think it's very bad for you, reading stuff online. I think people develop reading habits sitting in front of a screen, you know, which are really bad for them. It's what I call superficial reading. You don't digest it, you know. The, um, the, the Christian monks, the Benedictines, have a tradition they call Lectio Divina. That means divine reading, holy, holy reading. Right? And they, they, they come together, these monks, and they read passages from the Bible or whatever, very, very slowly and in a very meditative way until they feel that they reach a point where they want to stop and be silent and think about it. And we, we tend to just read, 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 read. And I think it's good to just read very slowly sometimes and digest what you're reading. Allow it to sink in. Maybe make notes as you go along. I, I often have a pen in my hand and a notebook, and I'll just note down good things I've read or um, ideas I've had while reading, you know, and how I might benefit from this paragraph, whatever, you know. So make reading into a kind of a a more varied, uh, enjoyable, and exciting experience, you know. Um, 
maybe have a glass of wine while we're reading, I don't know, a cup of tea, whatever suits you, you know. Um, because it should be part of your enjoyment of life, that's all. And you know, nowadays, it's a terrible thing because people would say, oh, you're, what are you doing? Oh, reading, what a waste of time, you know. Reading is not a waste of time, you know. Reading is terribly important. And it's dying, it's dying. A slow, steady death. And that's terrible to say it affairs. As a, as a teacher, my, one of my main jobs is to try and persuade my students to read. You know, it's like if you're a, if you're a doctor, you try and persuade your, your patients to eat proper food, you know. Don't go to McDonald's, but eat decent food. So if I'm, I'm a teacher, I'm saying, you know, don't just go online, read a book. Go and sit in a corner with a book. Get comfortable and choose a nice book. Maybe you like reading poetry, I don't know. I don't know you, so you, you, you need to know yourself. I mean, reading is part of the process of getting to know yourself. You know? It's you, you're reading, and every time you read a book, that book is something different. Every, with every reading, a book has a new life. You know? This is a very popular way of thinking amongst critics. But, I mean, I think it's true. And if, if you read it as a living experience, it will change you, but you will change it too. It becomes a different book. It's, it's, a, it's an interaction between you and that, that living book, you see. 